morning. Greetings, friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, Pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I use nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and sometimes deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your health and vitality and well-being, and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health challenge. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 31 years of practicing pharmacy, I have seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes, hypertension, obesity, skin diseases like acne, psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure. Because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And while some folks may call that healing, renewing, regenerating system a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we are here for you on the bright side, 844 Two three six sixty ten is our number eight four four two three six sixty ten. If you have questions about the longevity products, the longevity business, health challenges you or a loved one may be dealing with, we can help you. Eight four four two three six sixty ten is our number eight four four two three six sixty ten. If you want to purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised or recommended on the program, please head to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can order longevity products right off our websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team right off the websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. We've got blog posts, news stories, videos, as well as the longevity products, and a join the team link that you can click on for a one-time $25 fee. You can start a longevity business. You can be in business for yourself. You can help change the world at the fundamental level, the most fundamental level, which is the level of good health. Nothing else matters, folks. If you're not healthy, nothing else matters. Ask anyone who's got an autoimmune disease or, God forbid, cancer or heart disease. They'll tell you. Nothing else matters. It's all about health. And if you, if you are interested in changing your life or the lives of your friends, families, loved ones, at this foundational level, and you want to make some money doing it, if you're an entrepreneur, you like the entrepreneur lifestyle, please join the team. Click on the Join the Team link for a one-time $25 fee. You can be in business or call 866-735-2470, 866-735-2470 for more information. Okay, welcome back to The Bright Side. We have been talking a lot about stress, the number one health issue of our times, more specifically stress management. I think it's very important to make this distinction between stress and stress management. Stress management is reflected in stress management hormones in the body. Stress management hormone in the body. It gets called stress hormone, but it's really stress management hormone. And this is a very important distinction. Stresses are always going to be there. It's the management of the stress that's the issue. And the body is exquisitely able to manage stress. It has a biochemical system that's specifically designed in through millions of years of evolution to respond to stress. And it utilizes, like everything else in the body, utilizes chemistry. Specifically, in, in terms of stress, it utilizes stress hormone chemistry, stress management hormone ke chemistry, cortisol slash cholesterol. Cortisol slash cholesterol. I say that because, surprisingly to most folks, present company excluded, of course, they're essentially the same thing. Cortisol and cholesterol are essentially the same thing. So when we set... When we talk about cortisol as being stress management, that's what cholesterol is. It's stress management. The lunacy, the biochemical idiocy of a medical professional and the evil nature of a drug company, there's a distinction there too. Drug companies, they're just flat out evil. The medical professionals, they're not evil. They're just biochemically ignorant, some of them at times. Of shutting down stress management, <laughs> Because the stress management system has kicked in, 
causing heart disease, for example, is just it, it's astounding. Cortisol is cholesterol. They're essentially the same thing. And this, th this similarity in structure brings up a very important issue. It means, because cortisol is essentially cholesterol, the more stress management the body is going to have to provide for, the more cholesterol you're going to make. And that means the most effective way to lower your blood cholesterol is to reduce the stressors, chief of which is sugar. Drugs are stressors. Drugs are poisons. Nutritional depletion act can act as a stressor. Problems with oxygenation and respiration can act as stressors. Reduce the stressors. You will lower your cholesterol because cholesterol is cortisol. They're both stress management substances. Cortisol has a, little, a few little biochemical tweaks. A few little atoms here and there are different. Basically, it's the same thing. So cortisol and cholesterol are stress management. They help us manage stress. They are stress response. They're not stress hormones. They're stress response hormones. Body's always responding. Cells are always responding. The body and cells are responsible. They have an ability to respond. The cells and the, uh, the body are responsible for how our health shows up. We know this intuitively. Our health is a, a function of, of, first of all, our cells, and then our body responding to something. Responsiveness, the ability to respond, responsiveness is the essential condition, the sine qua non, the essential, quintessential condition of anything that's alive. A synonym for responsiveness is intelligence, making choices. Making intelligent choices, making supportive choices is a key feature of intelligence. That's what responding is. Responding is choosing. Intelligence, responsiveness, these are key features of everything that's alive. Everything that's living from a bacteria to a cell to an organ to a human being, everything that's alive is making choices and responding. A liver cell is responding, making choices for better or worse. A bone cell, a skin cell, these are all responses. Disease is a response. Psoriasis is a response. Acne is a response. Heart disease is a response. Cancer is a response. Osteoporosis is a response. And by the way, health is a response. The body's always responding. If we don't like a response, change what we're responding to. Stress and resp uh, the stress response, by the way, is called strain. Stress and strain. That's the official terms. They're engineering terms. And they were borrowed uh, in the 1920s. They were borrowed from, from, uh, from engineers. Stress is like the, the force that's up put on a bridge from the wind. And the strain is how much the bridge moves. Stress on a railroad track is the amount of pressure that's put on the track as the train goes by, and the amount that the, the, the movement in response to the stress is called strain. And this, I, these ideas of stress and strain, which are engineering ideas, were borrowed by biochemists. Uh, actually, one, one particular biochemist named Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E, Hans Selye, came up with something he called the general adaptation response, which is what he, what he described as the three stages of how the body responds when it's under duress. Stress and duress were really starting to become a big health issue in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Basically, towards the end of the 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution was kicking in big time, and as our understanding of the mind started to take place, Sigmund Freud started to come up with his ideas in the late 19th century, how we began to start to understand things about the mind and about our psychology and about how our psychology affected our biology. Hormones, they started to study hormones. They, started to, they discovered hormones right around that time. They started to synthesize hormones, particularly the steroid hormones. Various organs of the body, like the adrenal glands and the liver, were starting to become sites of research or targets of research. And this was all happening around 1920, the ni between the 1880s and 1920s or so. Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E, wrote a book called The Stress of Life. You can still get it off Amazon. It's a classic book on stress. And he came out with, with what he called the general adaptation syndrome. The general adaptation syndrome is a three-step process, which is, we'll talk about here in a second when we come back from our break, a three-step process that the body goes through when it's under duress, when it's under stress. And Hans Selye said this stress and duress is the, is the cause of all chronic diseases. And this is the third point on the triangle of disease. He was 100% correct. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back right after this. All right, we're back 
on the bright side, and we do have lines open for you. 844-236-6010 is our number. I am Pharmacist Ben. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific and 10 to 11 Central Time, and 24-7 on the archive pages at brightsideben.com and Ben Fuchs Archives or benfuchsarchive.com. We have search engines up. You can search various topics or guests or dates. Uh, we probably have, I think, six years plus of archives, seven years plus of archives or something like that uh, on all kinds of subjects that we've covered over the last uh, six or seven years. Today we're talking about cholesterol and cortisol. We've been talking about stress. and It's the number one health issue of our time, stress and misunderstandings of it. The lack of understanding of what stress really is. But stress has become this just boogeyman we just demonize the word stress. It's not the stress. It's the response to the stress. This whole idea of how uh, of stress and the body's response to stress is, was uh, first elucidated, at least scientifically by, or medically, by a guy named Hans Selye in the book, The uh, Stress of Life. He came up with something he called the General Adaptation Syndrome. The General Adaptation Syndrome is a three-step process that, according to Selye, describes how the body responds to stresses, stressors, A-R-E, alarm response exhaustion. That's the general adaptation syndrome, the stress response. It reminds me of uh, the famous quote by the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, or Arthur Schopenhauer, who said, uh, who said uh, new ideas are first laughed at, then they're resisted, and then they're finally accepted. He said that to describe new ideas, and that's kind of like the body's response to stress. First there's alarm, then there's resistance, and then there is... Uh, uh, then there's exhaustion, just giving up. And this highlights, by the way, the relationship between change and stress. Stress is really basically a type of change. The body doesn't like changes. Now, there are changes that are obviously are part of being alive, and the body has evolved a system to kind of modify those changes. Changes have to be assimilated and thereby eliminated. They get taken in, not resisted, but taken in, assimilated. The resistance is a result of cha uh, resistance to change or resistance to stress is a result of change that has somehow not been absorbed, taken in. The original meaning of stress, remember, is, is a, a force that's placed on an engineered object. It's the force. The force should be assimilated by the bridge, by the metal. A smart, a good engineer or good engineering will, or a, a good piece of, of uh, of textile or of steel or of iron will be able to assimilate forces, will be able to absorb forces. That's how you make a good bridge. I'm not an engineer, but I just assume that just that if you're going to make a good bridge, it has to be able to absorb the force of the wind. Can't keep swaying around. Now, the swaying is a manifestation of strain. Eventually, the strain is going to make the bridge break. But if a bridge is engineered correctly, strain will be minimal. Stress will be assimilated and absorbed. And the same thing is true about the body. Our stresses have to be absorbed. And that's not just physical stresses. That's psychological stresses, too. Emotional stresses. Grief is a classic example. Grief is a classic example of, how, of either an ability or an inability, depending on how you look at it, to handle change. Death is change. And we suffer from changes all the time. None is, none is non-negotiable, maybe, as death. But we do. We go through it all the time. It's part of being alive. And part of being alive is to be able to assimilate those stresses. In fact, according to something called systems theory, the body's a system, and there's a whole theory of how systems operate called systems theory. According to systems theory, when a system absorbs change or absorbs stress, it, a living system that is, a biological system, it gets stronger. It gets better. The assimilation process makes us stronger. The bone is always stronger at the point of the break. Exercise is a classic example of a, muscle, of a system, the muscle system, getting stronger. Stress can actually be your friend. When we respond to stress correctly, we'll get stronger, we'll get bigger, we'll get better. So you've got three stages of stress. You've got alarm, then you've got resistance, then you've got exhaustion. The first stage is always going to be there. You're always going to have some kind of stress, so you're always going to have some kind of alarm. Just by breathing, Breathing represents a stress, and the alarm system kicks in every time you inhale. Just by eating, the alarm system kicks in just when we eat. And it, you could be eating lettuce. That's why caloric restriction is so important, and that's why caloric restriction and fasting are so functional, because they reduce the stress on the body just by not eating. 
I'm not saying never eat, because remember, the body can handle stresses, and in this case, nourishment is important, obviously, but be respectful of eating. So the, the point we want to control is not necessarily the stress point, but the second stage. At this level, Celia says you get resistance, but I say <clears throat> we get homeostasis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Homeostasis is the ups getting pulled down, or the uh, ups going down and the downs going up. The body's constantly adjusting. Homeostasis. Celia calls it resistance, and it probably is resistance when the homeostatic mechanisms become overwhelmed. When the homeostatic mechanisms, what I said earlier was assimilation, is really technically homeostasis. Homeostasis Homeo meaning the same, or homeo meaning movement, I think. I don't even actually, homeo meaning the same, stasis meaning movement, not things staying the same. Things not moving. Homeostasis is the body's natural way of being. We're always homeostatic. That's responsiveness. Resistance, the second stage in the GAS, that's really where you run into a problem. You don't want to be resisting change. You want to be assimilating it, homeostatically manipulating it. We only resist when we're no longer able to handle a problem homeostatically. Homeostasis requires energy. Homeostasis requires nutrition. This is where our problem is, at least physiologic. physiologically. We don't have the energy to, to be able to assimilate the changes. And it starts with a poor nutrition. When nutrition is depleted, when we don't have the vitamins, we don't have the minerals, and when our stresses are chronic over and over and over and over again, especially food stresses, this is where we run into problems. We can't eliminate stress, that's part of life, but we can reduce the strain by improving the body's ability to handle the stress. Using nutrients, using vitamin C, quint, uh, the quintessential, well, vitamin C and the B complex are the quintessential anti-stress vitamins. Reducing the, the sources of, uh, of stress, the resource depleting agents, sugar, is a primary resource depleting agent that will keep us from being able to homeostatically handle stress. The more sugar we eat, ironically, we tend to eat sugar mentally when we're under stress, and that further depletes resources that help the body handle stress, which has us eating more sugar, which further depletes resources, which has us eating more sugar. Cigarettes, alcohol, drugs, how ironic is that? Drugs that are supposed to help us actually add stress to the body. They, incre they, they uh, increase the amount of nutrient depletion. They cause more nutrient depletion. That's one of the biggest problems with medication that nobody talks about. Not a single peep was heard about this in pharmacy school. And your doctor probably doesn't know, has not, never thought of this either, but common sense will tell you that you're depleting your nutrients when you take medication. Medication costs you nutrition, it costs you vitamins, it costs you vitamin C, it costs you essential fatty acids, it costs you the B complex, it costs you electrolytes, it costs you zinc, it costs you vitamin A. The drugs we take to get better, supposedly, or at least to stave off the symptoms, deplete our body of resources, causing more stress, causing more problems. And nobody talks about it, but it's common sense when you understand how the body works at least. All right, 844 is our number. I am Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We'll be back right after this. All right, we're back on The Bright Side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. 844-236-6010 is our number, 844-236-6010. We do have lines open for you. If you want to purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised or recommended on the Bright Side, please go to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can purchase your longevity products off the website. You can also sign up to join the Bright Side Ben team. We also have great information and in blog posts, news stories, uh, as well as videos, lots of free information. At brightsideben or at pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com, also benfuchsarchives.com. Also, would like you to check out our Truth Treatment products, our Truth Skin Health products at truthtreatments.com. Truth Retinol 5% Gel, Truth Transdermal C Serum, Truth Transdermal C Balm, and our Truth Omega 6 Healing Cream, all are delivery systems for vitamin C and vitamin A. That's basically what our Truth Treatments are delivery systems for nutrients, specifically nutrients. Uh, vitamin C and vitamin A, which are the skin's two most important nutrients topically, internally as, as well. When we, our skin doesn't look as good as we'd like it to when we get older, when fine lines start to appear, these are not skin problems. 
These are connective tissue problems. This is the one program where you're going to hear all about the connective tissue almost every time we speak. The connective tissue is what breaks down and is what, what is responsible for the visible signs of aging, most of the visible signs of aging, whether it's the stooped over, hunched over appearance that older folks have, osteoporosis, uh, deterioration of blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, and in the skin, wrinkles and fine lines. These are connective tissue problems. They're not skin problems. You have to be in the connective tissue in order to create changes for the most part. Interestingly, exfoliation, which does not go into the connective tissue, turns on the connective tissue. So exfoliating techniques are also helpful. But if, if you're going to drive the production of connective tissue, that is collagen and elastin, the good stuff, as well as the, the mushy hyaluronic acid and spongy stuff, you've got to be turning on the cells that make the connective tissue, the fibroblasts. And that's vitamin C and vitamin A, folks. There's no herbs that do it. There's no natural, I know everybody wants natural. No, no plant substances are going to do that. You need vitamin C and vitamin A. Of course, they're natural, I suppose. But that's not, the, that's not what the skin cares about. The skin doesn't care about natural. I did an interview with a gal from, uh, I think it was Elle magazine last week. I think it was Elle. One, one of those big New York uh, uh, fashion magazines. It's going to be published in May. And she wanted to know, the whole topic was, what, what is this thing natural? What, what's the big deal with natural? What does natural really mean? And I had to tell her, there's no, the skin doesn't care about natural. If anybody tells you about their skin products because they're natural, they don't know what they're talking about, at least in terms of creating changes in the skin. They may know what they're talking about in terms of natural, whatever that means. But in order to create changes in the skin, you have to be at the level of the fibroblast. The fibroblast doesn't care about natural. It cares about, do I recognize you? Can I work with you? Poison ivy is natural. Fibroblast does not need any poison ivy. Vitamin C and vitamin A, they're natural, but they're beyond natural. They're recognized. They're utilized. The skin has an ability, the fibroblast, the cell that makes all the good stuff, has an ability to use these substances. That's why vitamin C and vitamin A are the two most important topical nutrients, topical ingredients that you can ever put on your skin. Where can you get them? In high concentrations? TruthTreatments.com, TruthTreatments.com. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll get your calls here in just a sec. Uh, I've been really getting into this thing called mindfulness. I've been personally had a meditation program for since I was in my 20s. Mindfulness is, isn't exactly meditation. It's paying attention. And mindfulness is a powerful cortisol-lowering strategy, anti-stress strategy from... Uh, this is from uh, the Journal of the Medic of the Thailand Medical Association. Journal of the Medical Association of Thailand. Effects of mindfulness meditation on serum cortisol of medical students. Mindful me uh, mindfulness meditation is a method to relax the mind that decreases stress, which otherwise would increase serum cortisol. So, mindfulness meditation should decrease serum cortisol. Conclusion: Mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation lowers the cortisol levels in the blood, suggesting it can be used to lower stress and may decrease the risk of diseases. This uh, another one here. This one is from Newsweek magazine. Actually, mindfulness therapy as effective as antidepressants, according to new study. Recent, recent research into mindfulness focusing on the present moment through meditation has shown that the practice comes with myriad health benefits from alleviating pain to post-traumatic stress disorder. Why don't our doctors tell us about this? Because we don't need a doctor to meditate. Meditation beats medication. Meditation is using yourself, using your mind, using your power, using your inherent ability to, to deal with stresses rather than to be medicated. This is from Oxford University. They call it MBCT, by the way, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. According to William Kuyken, K-U-Y-K-E-N of Oxford University, professor of psychiatry and lead author of the study, while MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, fancy way of saying mindfulness, paying attention, is not a panacea. It does clearly offer those with substantial history of depression a new approach to learning skills to stay well in the long term. Well, what are your choices if you're depressed? Because the drugs don't work. In the book, The Emperor's New Drugs, I forgot the guy's name who wrote it. It's a great book if you're on anti-depressant uh, anti medication, The Emperor's New Drugs. Erwin Kirsch, I think his name was. He talks about how the vast majority of these things, these antidepressants, are placebo. 
They don't work any better than placebo, than a sugar pill. On the other hand, MBCT offers people a safe and empowering treatment choice when it comes to antidepressants or antidepression. Depression is another interesting subject. Uh, you know, I'm always hesitant to use nutrition or use physiologic or use physical strategies to deal with emotional issues. You know, we have a big problem with pain pills here, and everybody wants to make, the government wants to make pain pills even harder to get. And people who are really in pain now can't get pain pills. I'm a pharmacist. I don't like drugs, but I'm a pharmacist. And I tell you, I've had pain pills. I've been in pain. And thank God for pain pills. They are, if not the biggest advance, the most positive and most important advance in all of pharmacology, they're one of. You know how they used to have to do surgery without, without anesthetics? Can you imagine having surgery without, an anesthes without anesthesia? Can you imagine dealing with chronic long-term pain and not have any relief? Or surgical pain and not have any relief? The problem isn't the pain pills. The problem is everybody needs to escape from life. We've created a culture where we all need to escape from life. We're all in existential pain. It's the culture. All right, 844 is our number. Let's go to Wally in Wisconsin. Let me see if I get to Wally. Get to Wally here. What's up, Wally? Good morning. Hey, Ben. How are you, sir? Doing good. What's going on? i got two questions for you. Yes, um, sir. I'm calling in for a friend of a girlfriend in Montana. Friend of uh, a girlfriend, okay. Yeah, uh, the friend of the girlfriend has something called Chillman's disease. Okay, I know what that is. Uh, it's also called, I believe, eosinophilic fasciitis. That's 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 really a more a more descriptive term than Shulman's disease. It's actually called Shulman's syndrome because it affects everything, lots of different parts of the body. And this is a classic example of why medicine doesn't work. Medicine is obsessed with classification and diagnosis. And so they come up with these little names of things, and then they treat the names. And this is why medicine doesn't work, is because we're treating names. We're not treating biochemistry. We're treating diagnosis. Very subtle difference, but if you understand this difference, you can understand why medicine is a failure when it comes to dealing with these problems. Do you have a protocol to, to deal Absolutely. with Absolutely. You know, I'll tell you, it's, it's, you've heard me say it a million times if you've been listening to this program. So hang on. We'll talk about Shulman's disease or fasciitis, basically eosinophilic. E eosinophils are the cells of the immune system. So it's immune immune fasciitis. It's inflammation of the fascia. Okay, it's not, and fibers form. All right, hang on. We'll finish up when we come back from our break. Look. All right, we're back on the bright side. I'm pharmacist Ben. 844-236-6010 is our number. We do have lines open for you. We're talking to Wally in Wisconsin about Shulman's disease, and it's almost Shulman's, uh, Shulman's syndrome, actually, is almost like a textbook case an iconic example of this idiocy of the medical model when it comes to treating names and treating syndromes and treating diagnoses. And this is the reason why the medical model fails us. And it's a subtle difference, a subtle a point, but it's a very important point. You can't treat a diagnosis. You can only treat biochemistry. And you don't even treat biochemistry. You reverse biochemistry. Does that make sense, uh, Wally? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Do we have Wally? Did that make sense, Wally, how I explained that? Did you hear? I don't know if you heard what I said. Yes, yes, it does. Okay. So the biochemistry of Shulman's syndrome involves inflammation at the level of the fascia. Yes. The fascia, now we've talked about the fascia before. I haven't talked about it for a while. But he, the fascia is like um, the inside of a baseball. Did you ever open up a baseball when you were a kid? Oh, sure. you, right? You know how the inside has rubber bands in it, Right. Right. <laughs> A golf ball, too. I know I hear you laughing because I, I you must have done that when you were a kid, too. We used to do it all the time. We'd, yep. we'd, we'd hit a baseball until it just the coverage just was completely worn off of it because baseballs cost a lot of money back then, I guess. And, uh, and I was always fascinated by the inside, and the inside would have rubber bands in it. And I'm like, what the heck are those rubber bands doing? The rubber bands give the baseball spring. So when right. you hit it, it goes far right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. well, your body is a spring-loaded device, too, like a baseball. Spring, spring, it gives you leverage, so a little bit of movement gives you a large amount of, or a little bit of pressure gives you a large amount of movement. Golf balls use it, um, uh, baseballs use it, the body uses it. In the body, they don't have rub we don't have rubber bands, we have fascia. The fascia are the rubber bands. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Shulman syndrome is an inflammation of the fascia. Here's the thing about the fascia. The fascia is also known as connective tissue. We've talked about that a lot. Now, I'm going to say something very, very important now for anybody who's dealing with a chronic degenerative disease or anybody who wants to understand how these things take place, how they form. And this is very important for your friend, okay? Check this out. Listen up, okay? Mm -hmm. 
The connective tissue is the great dumping ground of blood toxins. Okay, the connective tissue is the garbage dump for the body, for blood toxicity. The connective tissue represents an ideal place to store uh, stuff that's clogging up the blood. So when you have fasciitis of any kind, or when you have a connective tissue problem of any kind, when you have an autoimmune disease of the connective tissue, when you have breakdown of the connective tissue, you are largely dealing with dumping out of toxicity, especially if the immune system is involved in this inflammation and fibrosis, which is what you're talking about, fasciitis. Inflammation, fibrosis of the fascia. The blood has become so toxic, it's now dumping off toxins into the connective tissue, into the fascia. The fascia become inflamed from all those, all, that, all those toxins. Sometimes the immune system can attack it. Then you get an autoimmune disease. But it all starts off with dirty blood. Is this making sense? Did I explain this okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if you just say it's Shulman's disease, who the heck is that? Who's Shulman? What has he got to do with, what does that got to do with the disease? But if you say fasciitis, now they say eosinophilic fasciitis. Eosinophils are, are uh, white blood cells. They're immune cells. So it doesn't, you can scratch that one off because obviously the immune system's involved. Right. So you're, you're dealing with an inflamed fascia following toxicity in the blood. So how do you handle it? Well, I mean, you don't need to be a rocket scientist here. You don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need eight years of medical school to figure this out. If you got stuff getting into the blood you got to eliminate that stuff that's getting into the blood. So how does stuff get into the blood? Well, you can shoot it up through your skin if you're an IV drug user, and that happens. And guess what? If you do shoot stuff up through your skin, you're at higher risk for fasciitis. But I'm going to presume your girlfriend's friend is not doing that. So where's the other source? Where's the other main entrance of toxicity into the blood? Food. And I'm not saying this because I'm Mr. Food Guy. I'm saying it because it's common sense. Are you with me, Wally? Yes, sir. Did I say anything hard to understand? No, sir. Of course not. It's just common sense. It's a plumbing problem. It's clogged plumbing. The stuff's getting dumped off in the connective tissue. Swear V cleanse, number one. Uh, a, f a food diary and elimination diet, number two. Nightly essence and probiotics and fermented food, number three. Digestive enzymes and apple cider vinegar, number four. Eliminate the sugar, number five. Get on a good nutritional supplement program like the Mighty 90 Essential Nutrients that you'll get in, uh, in the uh, uh, Healthy Start Pack. Number six, make sure she's sipping on the Beyond Tangy Tangerine. It would also be throwing in connective tissue building supplements, things like uh, cartilage, which also supports the immune system, bone soup, glucosamine, high aluronic acid, vitamin E, which can be tremendously protective for the connective tissue. High, uh, you'll get vitamin C in the Beyond Tangy Tangerine, of course, but I do extra vitamin C because you can't make connective tissue without vitamin C. Do you see how we're working here? This isn't anything you haven't heard before if you're listening to this program. Uh, also, keeping your cortisol down, re re relaxing the body, muscle relaxation, stretching, yoga, Pilates. Uh, we want more? Make sure she's practicing her SDR breathing, slow, deep, rhythmic breathing. These are everything we all have to do. She just has to do it with more vigilance. Does that make sense? Do you think possibly that this could be caused by an infection? If, if so, do you think a dose of minocycline? And no. I'll tell you why. Two reasons. If it was an infection, she'd have, she would have infectious symptoms. Okay. She would know. Secondly, minocycline kills bacteria, all bacteria, including gut bacteria. Considering the problem begins in the gut, it is completely counterproductive, borderline idiocy for anybody to prescribe minocycline to take, uh, for this kind of condition. Borderline idiocy. I'm not sure where that border is because it seems pretty idiotic to me when you understand where, uh, where the problem is beginning, right? There's no good drugs. Do you need minocycline sometimes? If you have an infection, maybe, yeah, but not for this condition like this. This is, this, this is your girlfriend's friend, so you don't, probably don't know the answer to this, or you may. Does she have any other health challenges? Does she have a history of digestive problems? Does she have a history of gluten intolerance? Does she have a history? You don't know the answer, or do you, are you saying no? I don't know the answer. You don't know the answer, right? Ask them. That's what I always do. I always ask. That's the first thing I always ask when I'm con doing a consultation. All right, what, what's, uh, we're running out of time here. What, did you have something else you want to ask? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you. A couple of years ago, I called you about a friend who had uh, turned out it was the West Nile virus. You were correct in your diagnosis. I, don't I, I never diagnose. First of all, say that again now. I didn't, I didn't quite catch that. I had call a, another call a couple of years ago where I asked you about symptoms, and you, and you said it was probably West Nile virus. And then I asked you if you would ever put on skis again. If I was ever put on what? If you, were ever, if you ever went skiing again. Oh, 
<laughs> Did I tell you about my skiing experience? I don't remember telling you that. I went skiing one time. I had a girlfriend who lived in Aspen. She grew up in Aspen. And uh, she was a big-time skier. And she got me on the mountain, man. And I looked down that thing. And there was no way. I had a history of bad knees and knee surgeries and stuff. There was no way I was getting on those skis or I was going down that mountain. So I ended up humiliatingly having to take the little toboggan down. And no, I never went skiing again. I don't, never plan on it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that Thank you very much for taking All right. Up. I appreciate you calling, Wally. I don't remember telling you that story. That, yeah, no, I, I, that never seemed like much fun to me. Although I have to say the Winter Olympics, those guys, those guys, uh, the, the skiers in the Winter Olympics, they're amazing. All right. That's it for today, I guess. Nobody else is on the call. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not being self-righteous here. I don't mean to be self-righteous. But it's so important that we understand how the, body is wor- how the body works when it's breaking down, how the body works, and how the body works when it breaks down. Because the doctors aren't helping us. The medical model's not helping us. We've created a culture of sickness and a culture of disease, and we're expecting the medical model to make a difference, and they can't do it. Because underneath it all, it's, it's not about the names of our diseases. It's about the biochemistry of our diseases. It's about the symptoms. And we don't need to have a doctor to address these basic biochemical symptomology because it is all coming from the same place. It's coming from the foods we're eating. It's coming from the nutrition we're not getting. And it's coming from uh, our inability or our lack of resources to handle the duresses, the ups and downs of life. None of this is medical. None of it. And I'm going to go to my grave saying this. We don't need the medical model to be healthy, with the exception, of course, of, uh, of mechanical trauma, that kind of thing. That's where the medical model excels. But when it comes to chronic, long-term degenerative diseases, it is about the choices we're making in our life. And it starts with, it starts with food, continues into nutritional supplementation, and then uh, it finishes up with stress management, food, nutritional supplementation, stress management. And when I say food, I'm talking about sugar as well. It's a triangle of disease, you guys. It's not difficult. It's something that we can all do for ourselves. It's something we should all do for ourselves. Remember, the human body is set up to live to 120 to 130 years. We're genetically capable of that. And we see it all the time. It doesn't happen frequently, but it happens all the time. People live to 120, 130, 140, 150 because that's what we're genetically capable of. Now, whether you want to live to 150 or not, I don't know, but certainly we don't have to decay and rot and deteriorate by age 50 or 60 or 70. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for listening to The Bright Side. Please check out my websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com for all the longevity products, and truthtreatments.com for our truth treatment products. Have yourselves a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, spectacular day. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.